All right, everybody, let's get going. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Eric with Motion Guidance. Um, and today's topic is going to be vestibular rehabilitation. Um, and this is a huge topic. Um, we see so many posts on our um, social media pages at Motion Guidance for Instagram, Twitter, and, and uh, Facebook. Um, a lot of uh, sharing of, of uh, vestibular applications all across the world. Um, people understanding the value of adding um, visual feedback to their uh, vestibular rehabilitation. Um, and we see a lot of crossing over of um, uh, visual feedback with vestibular applications and orthopedic applications, pediatric applications um, all over the place. So um, this is a really uh, hot topic of how to integrate this, uh, this tech into what you're doing with your clinic. Um, using it for assessment as well as treatment. And so we're going to go over a, a lot of different uh, applications here. Um, and it'll take us a while. I have a lot of videos um, showing applications that are drawn from my personal clinic as well as other things that have happened um, and we've done um, for some of our education series. So um, when we talk about vestibular um, under that umbrella, we're talking about things like traumatic brain injury. We're talking about uh, concussion. Uh, we're talking about um, balance activities, uh, gait and ambulation activities. Um, we're talking about movement disorders. And we're going to touch on all those types of things um, in, the, in the next half hour to 40 minutes, um, getting people up to speed about uh, stimulating the thought process of things that they can do for different applications like oculomotor, um, uh, balance uh, type of activities, uh, even some cognitive uh, overlay activities. Um, working with Parkinsonianisms um, and how we can uh, possibly uh, utilize visual feedback and uh, different forms of exter external focus of attention to help uh, get through bradykinetic or freezing um, episodes. Um, just going to be all over the place. Um, and so it should be, a, should be a great live stream. We'll take a few extra uh, seconds in between some videos to see if there's anything in the chat. So don't re uh, re uh, forget to um, include your questions into the chat uh, forum there, and we'll get to those uh, as we can. And so let's um, let's go ahead and get started. So I'm going to screen share, and the first thing we're going to do is um, look at some applications uh, for um, a patient that came into my office, and she has been diagnosed with um, non-BPP uh, dizziness, and there were some questions whether there was some central origin for that, and she's still getting some workup, um, but they wanted me to go through an evaluation with her, and I'm going to share part of that evaluation with her. We're, we're considering uh, Meniere's um, disease with her, um, some vestibulocochlear nerve um, things that could be going on, um, but she had regressed all the way to requiring a front-wheeled walker for her to ambulate, so she felt so dizzy um, and off uh, with the world that um, uh, she felt like she was going to fall uh, quite a bit. So I'm um, sorry with the general um, visual exam. So just regular smooth pursuits, um, active motion types of things. Um, those were all fine. Um, uh, no nystagmus with fixation um, uh, during, during testing. And uh, when she was doing general saccades, she had more trouble with vertical saccades than horizontal saccades. Um, VOR just didn't look right as she was doing it. She got immediately dizzy. Um, the pattern wasn't clean. So I decided to get her on the motion guidance system um, to see uh, a clearer picture of what was going on. And this is where people who are using this technology in clinic are really going to have an additive of um, uh, technology they can video with their phone um, or another device without having to uh, get very expensive equipment to do this. So let me share my screen. Let's go through the series of videos of what she looked like on day one, um, uh, going through her VOR and how this can, can change how you see uh, patients um, during your locular motor screening. All right, so let me, let me share my screen here. And we'll go through the, uh, the entire screen here so you can see everything. So let me get rid of rid of this. Okay, so let's take a look at this first video uh, here with her. And this was uh, this is shared with permission, of course. Um, so the setup here, let's go over this first. So she's five feet away from the target. That's how I standardize everything in clinic now because our maze uh, motion guidance uh, flag is set up for joint position sense air testing at five feet. Um, that was a previous um, 
uh, live stream that we talked about that, that that information can be found on our YouTube videos, um, Vimeo page, um, things like that. So um, she's five feet away. She has the um, the middle to large size um, band on her, her head, and she has the perpendicular mount with the green laser on. Now for initial testing, I have them look at the center target here. Um, so that's where their fixation is going to be for the VOR. Um, I have the laser up here. You can kind of see a little red, uh, excuse me, the green dot up here. And that's going to give me a representation going back and forth of what her VOR quality is, the distance side to side, and if there's anything else I need to kind of check out there. Now, the same with all of our testing. As we go through this, um, if it makes her dizzy, I want to know that. Um, we're going to do a, a general test for approximately 10 seconds. Um, but remember, treatment can be up to one minute uh, several times with the idea of stimulating them mildly. And if they do get stimulated, you might have to have them rest for a while to recover and then try that again, depending on what their symptom presentation is. But let's just roll this video and see what um, we see together. Let me get rid of the, the audio here. Um, so she's looking at the center red target and then just moving back and forth. So let's just watch this one time through. All right, so let's play that again. Let's break this down a little bit. So a couple things that you might have noticed when we're doing this, um, distance measurements. So I actually haven't ironed out the, the folds in my flags. I've, I've noticed that it actually gives me another distance measurement that I can see very easily, um, although these iron out pretty quickly on, on low heat um, if you uh, have that personality type, I guess. Um, I do have the laser so far up that she uh, can't really see it. It's not in her field of vision as she's going back and forth. You'll notice titubations. So you'll notice um, an irregularity of, of smoothness of the uh, excursion of the laser side to side. Um, we need to figure out why that is. We also are going to notice uh, um, a tendency to have increased left laser excursion here. So her right eye tends to be dominated forward when she's in that position. Um, versus toward the right, which would be left eye dominated in that position. So nose to the right is much less excursion than to the to the left. So let's take a look at those two things again as we roll this through. So you'll see her start slowly and as she tries to increase, she's off the flag oftentimes to the left and only to the right crease there um, on the flag. And she's up and down. She's just all over the place, but she has that tendency to be toward that left side. Um, and that reduces her dizziness when, when we ask her on report. So um, is that making you dizzy? Just mildly. So that gives us a baseline that we can share with her and say, hey, we're seeing these things. Let's not worry about the bouncing for right now, but let's see if we can um, do some things to train you to have more of a center um, equal excursion um, during your, your VOR. So if I get out of this video and I go on to the next one, so I've flipped the flag around um, to the other side. And this allows me to have more of an even excursion line on this side for her. Um, and we could have initiated the testing on this side, uh, but the, the butterfly pattern was already up on my wall, so we just did it there. I still have the laser above her on this, on this uh, uh, red circle here but she's gonna be looking at this orange target. So she's gonna definitely be able to see a little bit of that in the, um, uh, the visual field. And that's gonna give her some representation of the quality and the distance of her movement. And let's see how she, she does with this one. So let me just isolate this one a little bit, get rid of the audio again. And so as she starts to go back and forth um, with this one, she's looking at the orange target and this is just a practice run of her understanding how far she needs to go to the right to have equal motion. And she just doesn't like to do it. So you'll see her pause a little bit and say, hey, I got to really get over there. It's really easy to go to the left side. It's much harder to go to the right side. But it gives her a, a, a quantification of how far she needs to go in order to have equal motion of her VOR right versus left while still having a center gaze. And once again, her center gaze is down and through this area of the second orange target. All right. And these are practice runs on a scale of zero to 10. If we want to take like a VOMS type of score, um, she, she reports she feels a seven out of dizziness um, 
on that particular scale during that. And as we keep going through practice runs, let me get this bigger. Sorry. And there we go. Um, I need to remind her, hey, don't look directly at the laser. You're going to be looking at the a bottom line. But let's try to go back and forth at a faster cadence now and see if we can get closer to one hertz, which is our, our standardization for doing the VOR, going side to side. And now she's really trying to, if we watch this again, she's really trying to, to increase her speed um, and keep equidistance. And she just does not like it. But she's definitely learning that she has to go to that right side. She just can't go to the left side with the laser. She has to go back and forth. And so this is a form of improvement for us just by recognition that she has to go to that right side when she's doing her VOR. Okay, she just can't dominate to that the, the left side turn. And so as we keep going here with this practice with her, you'll definitely see a, an increased uniformity in her excursion side to side. It's not perfect, but this is all inside one training session, just different repetitions with it. Less titubation going up and down. She's getting a better understanding of what level on the horizon is. Um, with with her uh, with her VOR and she's showing dramatic improvement by allowing herself to um, get be better understanding with with visual representation of this and then of course we review the videos afterwards on this particular scale she got down to a three out of ten on dizziness as she reported compared to the first one which was a seven out of ten so we cut that in half on her dizziness scale over ten seconds. Um, in doing that. So if we go back to the first video, just as a quick comparison to that one. Okay, so she's really irregular in her cadence, definitely irregular in her distance uh, excursion from side to side. And she's got a lot of uh, changes in the, the horizontal plane going uh, up and down. So she's getting vertical at times, especially going toward the right. Um, and she's just kind of all over the place. So if, if you can imagine in small movements of just walking around and having her look back and forth, um, a VOR representation of her fixation there and what her head can do, we start to get a better picture of why she might be feeling uh, dizzy just walking around. All right. Um, so that's one example there. Let's go through a few more of the head and neck um, uh, while we're here. And then we're taking some chat questions. Uh, so here's one of our home exercise program videos. Um, another option with vestibular rehab is just doing time zero viewing or more kind of a, a motor control type of exercise uh, at the head neck. And so you'll see me here doing these and just going around uh, the different uh, butterfly patterns here and following this. So this is more cerebellar in nature um, versus uh, ocular motor reflex because um, the eyes and the head are falling through the same plane. Um, if this was very dysfunctional, there's, there's different things that we can look at here. So you can look at precision, um, and not only precision on the line, but precision in hemispheres. So above the line or below the line might tell you more temporal versus parietal involvement, um, right versus left side. So a cerebellar being an ipsilateral um, decompensation. Uh, might uh, tell you if there's a right versus a left side issue uh, working around this type of uh, target. Um, this can also be used for um, targeting and motivation. So uh, moving in through these uh, different outside targets uh, with, uh, with your head and getting um, off axis things. Um, this can also be used for saccades. So if I'm centering up the target here for my saccades, I can have a person look between the two targets in the horizontal plane back and forth. I can have them look up and down. I can cue them when to look so I can see what their eye fixation is. So I can um, be over here recording this from the back, looking at their eyes. And then, of course, going to different corners um, off axis can give you information about how um, smooth their saccade is. So what would that look like? Um, if it was dysfunctional, and typically we see the single side dysfunction or a hypotonic side, that the uh, if I have them look toward the right target, the laser would follow that target. So that would move over toward the three as they moved here. As they move to the left, it probably wouldn't move at all, or vice versa. If, it, if they had a dysfunction moving down to the right, um, they'd move their eyes down here, and the laser would follow their eyes. And so the laser allows us to um, learn where they're um, their pattern is not pure 
and therefore they can get some feedback on how they're doing um, without having to use an expensive software or something like that. We can also overlay this um, with some cognitive um, activities and they can move the laser with control and possibly with speed into a certain area based on maybe some math skills or a sequence of numbers. So if I say what's uh, two plus two, they'd have to move to the four. What's nine minus six, they'd have to move to the three. Uh, if I say three, eight, seven, move to the second number that I mentioned. So there's some short term memory recall, they'd have to move to the eight um, and they just have to compute these things. So with um, uh, depending on the effect of uh, CVA or some stroke or a traumatic brain injury that might be effective. You can also work on some peripheral vision uh, items here. Uh, so some dorsal stream actions where you have uh, the person bring up a card or you can bring up a card. They have to label the card. Um, and then after they uh, do the correct uh, color, they have to go to a certain uh, number. If they notice um, uh, the just the cognitive uh, input of either avoiding a go no go response by having them move too early. I'm moving on to other things here in the video. Um, those could also be implemented uh, there as well. So let's uh, let's go back see if there's any um, questions in the chat. I'm going to stop sharing here for a second. This will pop back on me. And I'll give uh, 30 seconds or so to uh, see if anybody has any questions about that in the chat or the, otherwise we'll move on to the, uh, the next area. We'll do more dynamic vestibular applications and some, some trunk things as well. And then we're finally gonna finish up with some, uh, some Parkinsonian uh, type applications uh, for vestibular today. All right, guys, looks like uh, everybody's just following along, getting some ideas, which is great. Uh, so let's jump, jump back over to videos. And let me, so, so let me screen share again, and we'll get the entire screen. I don't care if you see my background uh, on this. And so let's, nope, let's not do that one. Let's do this one. All right. Um, so another video that's on our uh, home exercise program a Vimeo page and YouTube page is going to be a uh, trunk um, action. So uh, in this case, we can do some narrow basis support or some single limb support. Um, so I'm going to be in single leg stance or in like a Romberg or a tandem type of stance. And we can work on uh, control of the pelvis. So not just trying to hold the, the body stable. That's going to be a common one with the visual feedback with the laser. Hey, just keep the laser inside of a certain target. So it could be this middle circle here, or it could be in a hemisphere um, or a quadrant um, on the flag, but actually starting to create some movement through that. So can we develop uh, people's uh, balance uh, reaction mechanisms to also include the willingness to be able to move inside of those to control? So not just trying to hold things stable, but gaining control through movement. Um, anybody who's ever been on a paddleboard or a surfboard in the ocean, um, if you are trying to just stay super stable, that can be very tough. Um, if you're actually trying to do a fluid movement, uh, a small movement through the ankles and through the pelvis and through the knees, that can help you gain stability on that, on that board. And that's what we're talking about with these same type of activities. So making the balance more engaging for your patient um, can yield improved results. Um, for them. So going through a pelvic tilt, going through hip range of motion there, and then combining those types of things, right? So getting more dynamic with your, your, your balance applications. Can you even force them to really go through large excursion mo uh, movements like you saw there? And of course, you could do some cognitive overlay with these things as well. This can uh, definitely promote some more advanced applications orthopedically as well as you have a, peop a person who maybe has a, an ankle sprain and they're recovering. Um, uh, that could be a, a fun one to go through as well. And then, um, so bird dogs are something very common in, in back uh, applications for exercise, in shoulder applications for exercise, but this is a midline cerebellar activity as well. So to keep that in mind as you're um, utilizing this for maybe some of your more true vestibular uh, patients, 
Um, but they could be under the drop target instead of the flag. Um, this is the flag example, but the drop target can be great. Um, having them be able to move um, without moving the laser can be a great place to start. Maybe adding some movement of the limbs on top of that can be a, another additive or starting to move the laser off the center of the target is, is um, what I'm going to work through uh, with this one. And of course, again, you can have them go through certain uh, numbers um, on the target. You can give them math to go along with that for some cognitive uh, overlay it can be a nice additive um, for engagement and motivation for your, for your patient. Uh, while they're while they're doing this activity or have them start crawling. Um, this is a great pediatric activity. If you're working with any pediatrics, having them crawl while keeping the laser on a line, even if it's a line that you made with tape on the ground or on the carpet in your clinic um, and making that engaged or having them move the laser side to side as they um, go through uh, the particular um, activity, um, really driving some midline cerebellar for posture activities. Um, you can, you can implement this type of, uh, treatment and, um, address that, uh, in a horizontal uh, position rather than always just the vertical position. And of course you can see me, uh, working on those, those number targets here and the motivation of being able to move, um, and call those out with different patterns. Okay. Um, as an application there. So let me remove some of these things and we'll go back to uh, some other activities. Let me get rid of some of this. All right. What do we have down here? So um, while we're on this topic, let's let's uh, let's move over to joint position sense uh, testing. So as I mentioned before, this has been um, completed in one of our previous live streams, but let's just review this real quick for those who weren't able to jump on that one. So inside of our clinician kit, um, we have a, this maze um, clock target that's included and we standardize joint position sense air testing inside of this. We put it five feet away from the target. Anything that's outside the target of this light blue um, circle here, this bullseye, is going to be outside the standard deviation, um, just by uh, adapting it with simple math. Um, anything inside the blue field is gonna be um, inside the standard deviation. So remember we do between one and three pre-tests with eyes open, the literature is a little bit variable for that. Um, but then we do up to six repetitions of eyes closed testing. Now, based on the current systematic review, I believe by DeVries, that was 2015, um, if you have three or more uh, repetitions that are outside the standard deviation, and again, that would be this light blue field, um, then that's going to be considered positive for a joint position sense air testing. So if I do three tests and all three are outside the standard deviation, I can go ahead and move on from that. Now, if I do four tests and they're all inside the standard deviation, I can also stop testing because that's not going to yield three positives for outside the standard deviation and those would be considered negative testing. So if we look at this gentleman um, doing the standard uh, testing, beauty of the ball and socket joint right here is that he can look at the center uh, target and then I'm moving the laser down into it. Don't have them move it down into it. They wanna keep their original posture there. He's gonna um, perform a repetition of eyes open. You can cue him to not turn his torso, of course, um, or put a laser on the torso. And then we can do eyes closed. Let's see if I can get this. And then he's gonna come back to where he thinks the center of the target is and let him kind of work on it for a second and then determine if they're in or out. So that was outside barely. He's gonna do another one here. He's gonna come down, he's gonna overshoot again. So that's outside the standard deviation again. Let's do another one. Again, we could do up to six. But what's going to happen here with his eyes closed? And he thought he made a correction and he's way off again. So that's that's three <laughs> um, out of a potential six. He already has a positive for a joint position sense air to right rotation. We'd have to redo for left rotation. You can do extension and you can do flexion. Um, if you're getting more dynamic, with, uh, which is what I do with my concussion patients, later on after they're feeling good, I'll come back and do their quadrant. Um, which is not very research based, but it kind of follows the same idea of, hey, can I have you look up and to the right and come back down to where you think it is? Can I have you look up and to the left, down and to the left, 
down and to the right and make sure that everything is kind of normalized across there. So I'll adapt the standardized testing into more uh, dynamic applications um, with that. All right, so that's uh, joint position sense air testing. Let me close these out again to get them out of the way. And other applications. So we can start um, getting some, some applications for uh, some dual tasking or some off axis training. So in this application, we have this person in single leg stance and he's gonna go through the combination of uh, time zero viewing. So motor control tracing in single leg stance and he's doing an infinity pattern here. So why would I want him to do this? As I challenge the system more and I narrow his base of support, we might see more decompensated activities there. And it's giving me a below and above access uh, representation here. So as he goes to the other side with 45 degrees, so he's pointed off axis um, off the target with his torso. He can either do the small uh, motions or he can do the large motions, which I think he's going to go through here. Now, if you watch what happens when he's to the left, he really changes his uh, control pattern. He freezes a little bit. He can't get back to the center. This one is nice and precise. And this one is still tough down there for him. If we compare that to the other side, which I think he'll go through next, got better there on that third one. As he starts to go through the other axis, down to the right and up to the left, much more comfortable for him to do that, okay? So that gives us some indication by seeing that immediate visual feedback, we got some things that we gotta work on in this position down here to retrain. So I'll probably take them through different size excursions I'll have them through, go through different extremes of right rotation to really drive home um, that right uh, cerebellar activity of the, with the cervical spine and have them go through those control patterns um, over in this lower quadrant based on what we saw with, with just the, uh, the simple visual feedback um, assessment there uh, for us. Other uh, actions that you could piggyback off of with this would be adding in some dual tasking. So we're gonna change the laser in this case from being on his head to being in his arm. So he's gonna go through more complex movement patterns, um, some more peripheral cerebellar activity and by going through some arcing motions with his arm. I have him in narrow basis support. So this is further progression. And then he's gonna dual task by doing a toss and catch with the left hand. This is definitely gonna be very tough, but this is progression over a few weeks for him. So. Um, if we play the video out here, you can see the complex movement pattern with the right hand. I want that elbow extended if possible. And then he's going to have to do a prediction task with dual tasking with the toss and catch. And he's on one leg. There is me videotaping. Okay, so as we can watch that one more time. Single leg stance, complex movement patterns. Maybe some peripheral vision, some dorsal stream vision going on there, dual tasking with a, a toss and catch there. So um, this person is uh, post CVA, mild effect. All right. So let's. Um, uh, thanks, Dr. Davidson. So great info and applications. Wanted to come back to the. Uh, let's stop sharing here for a second. Wanted to come back to the chat. Uh, before we move on to a few more dynamic walking applications with the motion guidance device, and then also get, get into that Parkinsonian or movement disorder um, population, just with some ideas. So if you have any questions for the chat, go ahead and throw those in there. Otherwise, we'll, we'll move on in just about 30 seconds. Don't forget to stay all the way through to the end today so I can give out the, uh, the code for discounts at our store at motionguidance.com. And again, visit us on social media channels at Ad Motion Guidance for Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Love the interaction there, especially from our international audience, people using motion guidance all over the world with different applications, much more engagement with these live streams, um, getting the word out of how to do this. Uh, so a question here, do you ever incorporate vibration of the neck or torso? Well, that's a great question. Um, some haptic input there. Um, I it, Just clinically, outside of motion guidance, yes, of course. Um, 
especially for, for particular patients, um, depending on if we're trying to uh, work on certain decompensations um, or stimulate certain systems to see if we can get others to kick on, we'll definitely incorporate vibration. I don't have a vibration machine um, in my clinic from a, from a platform standpoint. I think those are pretty cool. I bet to get that, that purchase in there. Um, but we will either uh, manually or uh, really dial down an input with like a, uh, a Theragun um, and put that on different parts of the body. That's a great question. Those could, that can be super effective depending on your patient population that you want to work with uh, that with. Um, I, I have been fooling around with that more also with uh, the movement dysfunction uh, population. So uh, things like uh, dystonia, um, things like Parkinsonianism, uh, orthostatic uh, tremor, things like those. Yeah, you're welcome. Great. All right. Uh, Last call for questions. Of course, we'll have another chat breakout session in just a just a moment. All right, good. All right, so let's uh, share the screen again and go through these last applications with walking and ambulation. All right, all right. So let's get rid of that. We just did that one, and so let's talk about these two. So this. Um, So this is a common one. This is called infinity walking or butterfly walking. So this is a, a pretty common setup in clinic, but I want to uh, show you the dynamics of adding in visual feedback immediately for what you might be able to see for decompensations and where you might need to train. Um, these are common applications that we see on social media or in some uh, educational series of just being able to do this. And people mark these as well. You're getting different parts of the vestibular system, the visual system. Um, body awareness, uh, mechanoreceptor integration, and of course, uh, being able to turn with the head and neck as well as the inner ear. And yes, those all check that box. Um, but there are differences uh, that we can understand with uh, putting the visual feedback on that allow us to tie into where they're having their biggest changes. So um, oftentimes this is done in a clinic where you have just targets on the ground or sometimes you put up chairs. I prefer chairs or a larger target. These are foam rollers that I use in my clinic because it allows them to also integrate the peripheral vision or the dorsal stream uh, vision for at least recognizing in space where they are compared to other objects. So for patients who are having a struggle with depth perception, or they're, maybe they're having some thalamus integration, a blind spot that's not really um, quite adapted yet to uh, get back to normal function, this can be super beneficial. So if we roll out this video and we just kind of watch it, uh, watch it, they have a, um, a drop target on the clock. I use a motion guidance contact pad to stick behind it. And they are just walking around while keeping their visual field high. So you can see if they start to visually cheat pretty easily because the laser will drop down. You've seen that already once and we'll watch this video again, but they just keep that centered up. They're going to be able to see with their peripheral vision where they are around those targets. And there's a consequence for these particular targets. So if you rub into the, um, uh, the, the foam rollers, you know, we'll talk about that there in a second, um, they could knock those over pretty easily. Um, it's gonna give them a sense of uh, motivation to not do that. Um, but he, if you notice, he has a certain side and a certain rotation, um, either visually or from the neck, that he doesn't like to move toward as comfortably. So let's go back over this video and take a look here. Okay, so we could break this down um, in real time. So um, he's moving to the left there, which is right uh, rotation as he comes back over. It's gonna be left cervical rotation as he, as he moves through. And he also has a, a, a narrowed excursion on the left compared to the foam roller. And he gets over and he's a little wider on this one. He, you can see him shuffling there to come back. So he doesn't look as comfortable over on that right side. And so once we stop him, we go, okay, go ahead and uh, go the opposite way for me. All right. Um, as he starts to back up, he doesn't like that change in direction. He kind of came off the target there a little bit, really drops down there. You can see that full excursion. He wants to put his hand out because he doesn't know where that is. Um, uh, compared to when he's moving around the other side. So this can really add a lot of value 
especially videotaping these and then going back over those later as a clinician or going them over uh, going over them with the patient in real time about where why are we working on what we're working on you can see these in real time as a clinician. You can see them in real time as a, as a patient, but also having a video log, if they'll allow you to do that, to show your progress over time, you might be able to save these still clips or videos into their um, patient file, depending on what sort of software you use. Um, they can add extras even on the documentation side for what you're working on. So um, that was a little bit of a, of a struggle over on this side and he knew it. Um, it just telling a little bit about his case as he went through further um, attempts at either going faster or really not looking at all and dropping that head down. He knocked the uh, the foam uh, roller over several times on this on this right side. Um, so we can take breaks and then go do that again uh, for him. But we also have uh, this video, which is um, progressing a little bit because he is going to then lose his visual field and have to turn his body to acquire it again. So he's actually going to turn toward the outside. Um, this is a great application for uh, uh, athletes. So as they're resolving from concussion, being able to lose their visual field and come back and acquire that visual field quickly can be super important for things like soccer, uh, football, where you literally have to have your head on a swivel and get that prediction, but you have to be might be moving very quickly, especially on like set plays in soccer from a corner kick, and people are moving around. They're leaving the the, the goalie area and they're coming back um, for headers. There's a lot of moving pieces. These can help uh, prime them for being able to go to back back to that environment. So if we play this, you'll see here as he moves through again in the infinity pattern. He keeps the laser on the target as long as he can, and then he'll take his head away. So it goes through a large cervical excursion and a body rotation there to come back. So this is the task. And you'll notice a few things on this task as we kind of run this through and then we'll back it up again. All right. So going through. So as he's going to the left side, he likes to come back and he's precise coming back onto the target on this side. As he goes through, he has to take a wider excursion here and he can't get the laser back up there very quickly. Here, he's right on the target as he comes back to it. As he comes back around this way and it takes a while for him to center that back up as he's moving. So again, we have a dominant side or a hypotonic side of, of a symptom presentation that he has to work on. So. He can see this, but he's going to need extra education about what we're doing. Okay, you line that one up very quickly. Get your head faster around. There you go. Get that laser on the target as you come back through. So if we look through that again, we can start some maybe here. So look at the lag and when that laser actually gets back on there. He's already passed the foam roller on this side. And he's at the foam before the foam roller on this side. So we have a little excursion measurement that we can go through there, a distance measurement. And again, he just can't get that right rotation coming back around. His visual field is not um, fixating quite as well on that target as he comes back around that side. So for him, this is probably not going to be that big of a deal functionally. For other higher level function uh, 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 people, like maybe some of your athletes, or people that have to move in tight spaces very quickly, this will be tough. The faster they have to move, of course, the, the chance of them having a dizziness score might go up. Um, so on that VOMS of between uh, zero and 10, uh, they might be uh, the higher on that uh, type, of, type of score for dizziness, but they can train this. Once they see it and they see where their deficit is, they can give themselves feedback about how well they're doing um, which is great because then motion guidance ends up being just as much of a coach as it is a tool for us. All right. And then let's take a look finally at um, this application. Now, this was uh, posted with permission um, for this uh, presentation today or given permission for it. This is a video sent in to us um, from a, a person who works a lot, with, a lot with Parkinsonian patients. And he just wanted to show us the different things that he's working on. I have a current patient right now who has um, orthostatic uh, tremor. Um, so she just in resting, she starts to get tremor, but she doesn't have the same presentation or the same diagnostics as uh, Parkinsonianism. So if we look at this particular video, this person has Parkinson's as a diagnosis. He's going back and forth between two targets for, for some motor control applications. 
There's a huge postural component of as soon as they turn on the laser and they want to keep during his walking, keep the laser on the target. Um, let me go back just a second. Um, his posture, his upright posture changes. And as everybody's probably understanding on this call, that forward posture, that center of gravity change um, can be super important as far as predictability for falls. Um, mix that with a bradykinetic and a freezing posture. And, and that's where Parkinsonian's patients really get into trouble. So he is using this for training of upright posture, um, gaze fixation out into the community rather than, than uh, typical gaze fixation, which is down here at the floor. Um, and working on that through different functional patterns. Then he's getting them to do different things. So if we uh, play this video further, um, he's using our motion guidance uh, maze with the JPE flag on it and the clock uh, overlay to get them to do cognitive challenges. So go to a certain number based on some math. Uh, we showed this earlier in the live stream and coming back to the middle, he's also gonna show a person working through the, um, uh, the maze um, with uh, um, uh, this particular uh, setup here. So um, you'll see the target move back and forth on the clock and then moving around the maze. So um, what I am seeing personally with my, if I pause this for a second and just give a little bit of um, extra input, with my orthostatic tremor, she didn't want her video up here, so I respected that. But with the orthostatic tremor that I'm seeing, my patient that has just a, um, a basal ganglia uh, issue, but it's, it's much less common than Parkinsonianism, but it's not Parkinson, Parkinson's disease, is moving through the, the maze, she will still freeze a little bit. Um, and, the, the, and she'll start to shake with her tremor. The more that she notices that she freezes, the more tremor she gets. So she's been working on this and working through the maze, reducing that freezing and bradykinetic um, uh, response. And she's improving her time through the maze. Um, so we'll time her uh, start down here to finish, or she'll go in reverse and go from the finish back down to the start. Um, and she's noticing improvements that carry over into real time of she's starting to change her thought process when she gets this, the tremor to stop focusing on the tremor, but focusing on the breakthroughs. Um, so this will hopefully be um, encouraging uh, um, in this population, maybe with some uh, research in the future uh, for anybody who's interested in this population, maybe look for that coming up. Um, but again, an external focus of attention. So instead of just trying to initiate, hey, can you put your foot in the box? The laser is going to go into the box. And then he's doing a more of a dynamic movement with a with a jump um, to step on the laser as he goes through. I thought this was a great application um, for working on getting through that, that bradykinetic posture. And then muscle coordination obviously carries over to some functional activity. So he has them work on timing with boxing, which I think is great for motor um, applications and for cerebellar function. Same thing here, just being able to get the timing right, get their them up there and, and uh, being able to uh, function through. And then uh, more upright posture things. I think he even has them playing ping pong uh, toward the end of this, which is which has other great things. So look at that Park, Parkinson's project. Um, look them up. They're, they're a great organization. Um, and uh, I appreciate them sharing that video with us for this particular uh, live stream. So... Uh, so let's get back out of that. Let's go into uh, back into the chat form. I'm going to stop sharing here. All right, great. Okay, so um, any more questions? Uh, got one coming in. I've used the figure eight walking, just looking at a target with the head turns, but when you use the motion guidance, it's a great assessment tool to see where deficits are. Um, I hope that really helps. Um, uh, you that's that's a great comment and I, I think that's exactly tying into what we see a lot of people uh, doing applications in vestibular rehabilitation and they're good applications and they can, they definitely can work otherwise we wouldn't use them but having people understand exactly where their deficits are in these applications can be a, a real world changer for for some of our patients um, whether that's using an ocular motor um, the infinity type walking um, so I hope this helps in getting people to to use that visual feedback more uh, commonly uh, for the application process uh, that we're using for exercises for those patients. So I really appreciate your comment. Um, any others?
uh, before we get this live stream uh, taken care of for today. Give a few minutes there. Oh, great. And you are from Ireland. Awesome. Thanks for coming in for this uh, live stream. That's great to have you. Appreciate that. All right, so let's get on to code. So the code for today for completing through the uh, the live stream, if you go on to motionguidance.com and you type in Black Friday 30, um, we're actually giving a little bit of an extra discount for the live stream for the Black Friday um, uh, discounts coming up uh, in Austin, Texas. Okay, good. Uh, that's great. Um, so Black Friday 30 will get you 30% off all of our products. And um, except for the uh, uh, the bundled distributor pack, so everything else you get thirty percent off um, of the of the store if you go on to uh, motionguidance.com. And please don't forget to go on to our YouTube page and our Vimeo page. Um, look at these applications. We have a lot of things that uh, tie into our our home packs, um, which the Parkinsonian group is starting to give a lot of those out, so people have that regular input i remember as distributors you're getting those at a lower cost to either pass that savings on to your patients or to drive revenue through your clinics so make sure you check those out um, and if you have more questions after this is done please uh, email us at info at motionguidance.com that's going to come to myself as well as dr tal blair and we'll both be able to answer those questions um, for everybody out there in uh, motion guidance land all right all right. Well, thanks for joining us today and uh, look forward to our next application. That's in a few weeks. Uh, our next live stream goes over golf applications and sports specific applications. So we hope to see you there for that. Everybody have a good holiday season and we'll talk soon. Have a good day.